My conversation today is with the late Pierre Grimes. Pierre needs no introduction, but suffice it to say that he was an academic pioneer, founding the Noetic Society, as well as a philosophical sojourner in a bygone age of intellectual adventure. Part platonic philosopher and part poet, Pierre spoke openly and candidly about his experiences with peers such as Joseph Campbell, Alan Watts, and other legendary philosophical and literary personages of the 20th century. Pierre and I spoke about some of our favorite subjects, including Platonism, Taoism, psychophilosophical perspectives of the self, and more. Pierre passed on June 2nd of this year, and this episode is dedicated to his memory. I'm Ike Baker, and this is the Arcanum Podcast. Well, Pierre ah. Grimes, thank you so much for uh, for being with me today. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, it's an honor. Um, you, myself, and Adina Bezarita, we just had sort of a little preview class um, for the New Hermopolis Conference. You gave a presentation, which was fantastic, by the way, uh, entitled um, A Hellenic Exploration of the I Ching. So uh, I know we had spoken a little bit, and you got into some of it in the in the um, the course itself. But uh, I'm I'm curious if we could explore, you know, how you uh, discovered this convergence of uh, Hel- Hellenic philosophy and <clears throat> and really Taoist philosophy. <clears throat> well, that's a. Uh... <clears throat> A very good question, you see. Um, I would say that uh, my primary interest was born in the uh, middle 50s, 1955. Uh, <clears throat> I had a a dream experience of divine illumination. Brilliant light of being, they call it. Wow. And then when I came out of it, I said to myself, here, I think you can get back into it right now. And so... It al- <clears throat> the circumstances were such that it allowed that passageway. <clears throat> well, I was studying at the American Academy of Asian Studies, where Alan Watts gave me a fellowship to be a lecturer in comparative philosophy. And... I never mentioned this to Alan. Matter of fact, I didn't mention it to anyone for many, many years. But therefore, I was drawn to Eastern thought because of the poverty that I experienced in Western philosophy. And... In 1952, I was in touch with Joseph Campbell, and we had coffee in Greenwich Village, and I said to Joe, I said, Joe, where is real philosophy going on? Because it's not going on, so far as I can see, anywhere in Europe. He said, Pierre, it's dead. But I have a friend of mine, Alan Watts, in San Francisco, who's starting a a graduate school only using native teachers. I said, good heavens, what kinds of teachers? He said, well, there's a Tibetan yoga who was a Japanese Buddhist 
who traveled all the way into Tibet and became the Dalai Lama's uh, teacher for some eight years. So I said, good heavens, what else is there? And he said, well, Jiming Shen is there. I said, I don't know the name. Uh, he, said, he said, Taoist. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I've read a little bit about Taoism. He said, there's also a Hindu philosopher that Sri Aurobindo recommended to be a representative. I said, thank you, that's enough. <laughs> I got in my 1936 convertible LaSalle, piled in a one-eyed dog, <laughs> and San Francisco, I came. <laughs> that's a classic story. That's a classic tale right there. <laughs> I mean, it was a luxury, you know, uh, to make it simple, uh, my Tibetan teacher, uh, Lama Tata, Lama Tata <clears throat> offered a series of lectures and three people showed up. There was no interest that could support a public lecture on Tibetan Buddhism. Uh-oh. <clears throat> Along came the revolution. LSD hit San Francisco. <laughs> now <laughs> there were larger audiences. <laughs> there was a renaissance. We began reliving the Hellenic vision of the Eleusinian mysteries. Wow. Which, of course, is derived, <clears throat> the substance of that ritual is a uh, uh, early form of LSD. It grows on wheat as an ergot. And they were using this substance with others as the basis of a, a, a identity, they gained a, a unity. Uh, thousands of people participated in this. And therefore, I was looking at LSD hitting San Francisco saying, hey, wow, this is going to be another renaissance. So <clears throat> I dropped some acid and uh, re-entered the brilliant light of being or divine luminosity again, only this time uh, for a nice period of time, maybe 20, 20 minutes or more, maybe a half hour. Therefore, you see, I was then moving from Taoism to Indian philosophy, to Chinese philosophy in this small school in San Francisco. And uh, <clears throat> simultaneously, uh, I got involved in Buddhism. And the, the big difference came with three pillars of Zen, Kaplos. So I went to Maizumi Roshi, who I knew, and a friend of mine and I, we had coffee, a tea, tea or coffee with him. And we said, look, why don't you run sessions? He said, oh, Americans wouldn't go for it. We said, come on, just run a two or three day one and watch. And sure enough, it filled. That started there for extended meditation periods with Maizumi Roshi which I participated in over the years. So that, see, the thing that puzzled me fundamentally, now going to your question, after the, these kinds of experiences, I still recognized I had personal problems, interrelational problems. Mm -hmm. And that really bugged me. And, uh, <clears throat> Luckily enough, um, I needed a job, so I got a job as a uh, social worker in San Francisco. 
and they had a rehabilitation center in Redwood City. And they assigned me there as the only therapist at the therapy center. Um, so when I got there, um, I asked the doctor in charge, I said, are there any restrictions in what I might do with these people? He said, look, do anything you want. Nothing works. <laughs> so as long as you don't physically injure anybody, go ahead. So I worked with some people and finally I had an idea. I'd ask each one of these alcoholics, especially periodic alcoholics, <clears throat> when they came back after they're drunk, I'd say, look, let's put it on the board. We had big blackboards. And so we'd map out the cycles and we found that they repeated themselves. And I said, well, what the hell is going on? What's behind this cycle? This cycle? One person broke it. He was a chemist. And we gone through many of these cycles. And finally, he said, you know, <clears throat> I think I have an early memory I need to talk about. I said, well, go right ahead. He said, it may not fit. I said, go ahead. He said, I was nine years old or eight living in New York. And uh, he said, you know, curiously enough, We'd play football out in the street without any proper clothing, etc. This is early years. And he said, my mother stood by the doorway. She put her arm around me and she said, son, go out, do your best. Either come home with your shield or without it. I said, oh, my God, that's Spartan. They're Greeks. So I said to him, hey, wait a minute. Look at your cycle. Every time you're on a drunk, you finally are brought back into a hospital on a stretcher. Hey, you're being carried on a shield. You're coming. Hey, you're living. He said, I'm reliving it. I said, it looks like that was a, a learning. You learned something. He said, yeah. He said, you know what? That's the only time my mother really put her arms around me. She was very busy with the other kids. So this really was a very high moment of beauty and love. I said, that's, that's the condition for real learning. That started my book that later became Philosophical Midwifery, mm -hmm. which was, hey, if you have a problem, go to the root of it find the root of it by finding what you have learned in your early years that framed your expectation on the moment and you're living out that early scene. Well, now I could sit back and say, wait a minute. I have now participated in many, let's call them, uh, <clears throat> I call them the, the, uh, the, the the wisdom, the wisdom of each of these nations, the wisdom of the Tibetans, the wisdom of the of Chinese Taoism, the wisdom of uh, Advaita Vedanta. Uh, there's something missing in each of them. They don't know how to deal with human problems, such as I just mentioned. Mm. I said, by God, you know what we need to do? We need to be able to bring all the wisdom traditions together into a unity and make sure, therefore, they have a place within them for searching out why their own people are blocked and are stuck in their own past and are not free in their own spiritual development. So that has been the... the what's been driving me, as it were, from the earliest days. Mm. 
And uh, <clears throat> I finally ended up with uh, studying Korean Buddhism. And uh, <clears throat> there I met and worked with Myo Bong. And he said, hey, Pierre, come on over to the temple. Let's have a cup of tea. I said, okay. By the way, he used to show up at, at my our meetings we had exploring dreams and personal problems for maybe three months. Never said a word, sat in the back. So I dropped over the temple and he said, hey, Pierre, you know what you are? You're a teacher. I said, no, I'm not. I just show people how to read. I really help them understand. He said, no, 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 no. You're a, you are a teacher, capital T. I said, no. He said, here, you're now my Dharma successor. I said, what? So he gave me a Dharma stick and I gave it back to him. And I said, no, no, I'm not a, <clears throat> I'm not a, I'm a, <laughs> I'm doing what I wanted to do. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to put on robes. He said, look, here, whether you like it or not, you're my Dharma successor. I said, wait a minute. He said, I have an idea. I'll prove to you you are really a spiritual teacher. I said, go ahead. I'm for it. He said, show up every Thursday at my temple and I will prepare the Diamond Sutra. I will translate it myself. You will not be able to have a copy till five minutes before you go up and give a talk on the Diamond Sutra. I said, okay. Oh, wait a minute. Then you have to then show up before my group and give a talk on Plato's Parmenides. <laughs> He said, sure. <laughs> so we we went through it and a key several key uh sections of the Diamond Suture became vividly clear. And uh, I said, Hey, that's it. I'm a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, this thing just opened up right now in front of us and uh okay. So then I said, well, now it's your turn. He's now going to give a talk on Plato's Parmenides, which is, the, by the way, one of the most sophisticated wisdom uh, pieces of literature or philosophy I believe one can find. In any case, uh, I was teaching night at night, Monday nights, only this was a holiday. So I thought I'd drop by the temple. And I got in there and I said to the one of the monks, hey, where is he? And he's always upstairs. So I ran upstairs. And there he is with a friend of mine who is guiding him through the Parmenides hypotheses. And I said, wait a minute. That's cheating. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, and in, in summary, uh, I think the most important thing is that we have to craft a new golden age based upon the highest kinds of wisdom traditions that exist, bring them together into a unity, Find a place for how man can mature his own vision and get over whatever blocks he experiences that are presently, unsuspectedly, by the way, because when we have a problem, we don't have a faintest idea of its origin. So it comes as something quite unexpected. It's not a blame game. Right. Yeah. So, um, when you start with a simple question, you get me going through this recollection. <laughs> it, no, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I love to hear. And I know that other people, 
this is high value kind of um, stuff. And, and, you know, because you're a high value teacher and philosopher and uh, you know, I, I consider you and your work to be, I, I would say in the most dignified uh, um, respect, you know, an elder of, of this community and, and communities only can only thrive when they reach back to their elders. And, and in some way that's what we do when we reach back also to Plato, but sometimes, sometimes there's such a span between us and our elders that we need intermediaries to kind of explain it to us and, and sort of reinterpret. So, I mean, I think that's something that you do really well. And I'm, I'm interested because if you're familiar with this channel, I mean, we've talked Platonism with Jake Traer, Danny Newman, um, Eric Arrowall, Dr. Gregory Shaw, we, you know, we've gone through a lot of Platonism, so we could really have a, a somewhat of a, of a high level discussion regarding it. But I'm, I'm curious, I view the, the Platonic dialogues more so as mystical documents than anything else. And I'm curious, was there a moment or an epoch where Platonism, uh, let's say the Parmenides, for example, when that really proved itself to you, when you, you had like an aha moment? I, you got it. You see, <clears throat> the problem, the problem anybody faces is that we're living in a culture that is dominated by a certain kind of philosophy. Essentially, it's cynic philosophy. Practical practicalities uh, create meaning only out of the everyday world. Now, what I got into, the reason I got into deeply into Plato is because I was reading Homer. And I got into Homer and I was with a group of people and good heavens. The idea came up, I said, wait a minute, look, let's look at the Greek. No, hey, in Homer, probably 500 places they use the word self. It is never translated wow. in English as self. Now, one of the great points in Homer's Iliad is Achilles having an enlightenment experience. But, you know, as that unfolds, he then states that whole enlightenment experience, brilliant light of being, came from the self. You won't find that in any translation. Hey, our modern translators refuse to use the idea of self. <clears throat> then I ran to Plato and I said, wait a minute. Now, some of my good friends are really interested in classic Greek. They know Greek very well. I have a basic. Hey, we found in the Parmenides 540 places where he uses the idea of self and nowhere is it translated. Why is that important? <laughs> the first hypothesis, the summa, the highest point, it's not the one. He says, I must start from myself, from my own hypothesis, which is the one self. They cut out the self. Wow. So that the second big issue is when you're getting into classic Greek thought, you see, it's the word essence. Now, that word is all, you know, in Chinese philosophy, it's in Buddhism. Yeah, that word appears in translations. But in Greek, watch. The mind, the mind when it is free, seeks to know itself. Therefore, the mind turning upon itself to know itself is the word usia, which is the word essence. And that moment, you see, 
that's intelligent, that shows intelligence, vitality, life, meaning, all together into a unity. Mm. Now, would you mind trying to defend the use of the word essence <laughs> to explain that word? Yeah. They cut it out. And the last one is the logos. Because the brilliant light of being, when, when one, one has to try to understand what words would best describe it, one word will, will rise to the surface. And that is mindfulness. It's the mind knowing the mind. It's the intellect turning upon itself and knowing itself. Mm. Therefore, that the what whatever is the source of that mindfulness is the logos. Wow. So, so none of those connections are possible with the present translations. Now I have a friend of a friend of mine, a couple, and they have been doing now beautiful translations of this material where they leave it in and their name of course is the balboas b-a-l no balboas so, so why I, do, you, do you think do you why do you think do you think it was an accident of trends do you think they were just having issues figuring it out and, and so they decided to cut certain words or what, what what's your thoughts on why those things were left untranslated or improperly so well let me try something try this <clears throat> What if in the New Testament we added this one sentence? Without the self, nothing would ever come to be. Mm. How important would that be to put in the New Testament? <laughs> hey, you know what? It's there. Wait a minute. What do you mean it's there? It's in the Greek. It's Lovely. there. Yeah. Nobody wants to translate the idea of self in the New Testament mm. because we're inundated by the influence of Paul, not the Gospels. So, you know, Christians think they're Christians. They're not. They're Pauline. They're followers of Pauline. Yeah, that's always it's always extremely surprising to me how it, it, within Christian communities and and within I would say communities that are highly critical of Christianity, um, there most of the things that they'll quote are outside of the four canonical gospels. It's either Old Testament, lots of Paul, tons of Paul, you know. So it's always very surprising to me. I'm glad you mentioned that. That's absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and then no one, no one is interested in bringing their own students to a real understanding by mastering the text. Like I recently had a talk with them, and all I had to say to them was, excuse me, you guys are reading you think you're reading the Genesis. You're going for the story of Adam and Eve. You know what? You're not in it. You are interpreting it. If you just stay with what's there, you'll get a totally different vision mm. of what maybe you should or should not believe. Like, here's a simple one. I, I, I said, look, here. in the Garden of Eden, there are only four characters. Adam, Eve, God, the serpent. Just read it once. Just once with one thing in mind. Any statement made that has any future consequence to it, write it down. All right? Link it with whoever is the author. Read the rest of the story and see how many of those things turn out to be true in terms of the story. 
then grade. Give a grade. Right? You're a teacher. You're handing out this assignment. Well, the serpent gets an A. God gets an F. Adam gets a, a C. Eve gets a B. And I said, look here, just do one more thing. You guys think Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. You know what? It ain't there. Only Adam is kicked out of the garden. God says that he, he, he will be. He, 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 not she, not them. Adam. By the way, that doesn't fit anyhow, because if they read tighter, the last couple of lines with Adam is he's in the garden where God sent him to tend the earth from which he was taken. Mm. Wait a minute. That means he's still there. So anyhow, that was the end of my discussion just the other day. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, I mean, that's a great approach, you know, to um, uh, biblical exegesis, particularly for that, for that story, you know, the, and the two creation myths and oh. things like that. And Adam having, you know, uh, <laughs> just a different, a different story, a previous wife and things like that. But um I, I really enjoyed what you have to say about the logos. I'm wondering, so oh. I'm, re I'm 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 wondering then how that applies to pathologos, you know, of let's say in the Republic or something like that. I think there, you know, it, let's say in like the the analogy of the divided line, um, and this notion of of pathologos. What are you What are your thoughts um, on that? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> The difference between the Republic and the Parmenides is that in the Republic, Plato is asked to explore the, his, the highest vision. And he turns to his group and he says, hey, you know what? I don't have right now the energy for this. I'll tell you what he says. I'll give you the second best. The second best is the brilliant light of being, or what we call the second hypothesis. So therefore, the Republic is the second level. And therefore, it doesn't get into the higher level. That's left for the Parmenides to get into. Okay. Why is that important? In the divided line, the highest intellectual functioning is what he calls episteme, knowing, right? But hey, knowing fits for that experience because one encounters it, what learns from it, one can pull from it certain kinds of concepts and ideas, but that's not the highest because in the Parmenides, none of those, uh, those we'll call them attributes can be assigned to the one self. Now, in the exploration of the first hypothesis, Sometimes people call it the study of the negatives. But while it is an exploration of the negatives, it's that's because he's only talking about the nature of a pure one. Now, in the Republic and the arithmetic, he talks about oneself. He talks about a pure one. That's what he's using to explain the, in the Parmenides the nature of the highest vision. Wait a minute. All of these things, therefore, are denied that are attributed to the second hypothesis. Beauty, goodness, justice. What's left? Logos. Hey, the only positive thing 
that Plato is pointing to is that to be able to understand the first hypothesis, you need the logos. You need to be able to bring your highest vision of the intellect with you as a guide for understanding the first hypothesis. Now, what is it? Hey, you see, uh, after all of the explorations in philosophy, they are all ideas. Now, that's a Greek word. It's not an English word. The Greek word is eidos. We anglicize that, calling it an idea. <clears throat> but for Plato and the Greeks, eidos means that which you behold. So therefore, it's not a concept. Interesting. That upon which you behold. What you behold, therefore, is the Logos. Now, in Christian theology, if you get there, uh, you could say that the mind of God is the Logos. Now, in the Gospel of John, in Archaeo Logos, in the beginning was the word, then the word was God, therefore the Logos is divine, is God. But you know what? He, he, he ends that exploration for the rest of the dialogue or the, the gospel. Mm -hmm. And it's only picked up on the Nag and in the gospel of, of James. You see, they... They, there were once 50, more about 50 different Gospels, and we just uncovered them in the Agnacomati Library, <clears throat> as they call it. Well, the, for you and I, Ike, the most important one is James, because James in the Gospel of John, Jesus calls James his twin. Brother, yeah, yeah. Right, his twin. <laughs> Therefore, the gospel of James and the Nagamati, it that's the twin. And he's giving, therefore, the teaching, which is, which is all platonic. Mm -hmm. Yes. And therefore, what they did with Emperor Constantine during that period of Constantine, 350, A.D., they destroyed all competing Gospels and only kept those four. Therefore, we had no knowledge other than the opening lines of John connecting it with the Greeks. But now modern scholarship is finding more and more points that refer to the, the Greek culture, because the New Testament is written in Greek. Right. That was the Greek culture at that time. So the, the idea of the Logos is the, in principle, the highest vision you can have of what's, of the nature of the intelligible. Yeah, I, I, that, that's an excellent point. You know, I, I, I was having a discussion this morning about the idea of, you know, Hellenized Judaism and the the early, you know, Jewish populations in Alexandria, where yeah. we found we found the Nag Hammadi Gospels in Alexandria, just outside, and the whole, you know, around the first first century CE, right? You know, the supposed time of the uh, the Christ event, you have. 40% uh, of the total population of Alexandria was Jewish, but it was it was highly Hellenized. You have the Septuagint being translated around that time. You have the Hecalot and Mer Merkaba literature, which which is highly theurgic, highly, highly theurgic. And, you know, taking the entire uh, cosmology and ontology is is taken uh, as a technical schematic for yeah. this, this ascent from 
uh, Neoplatonism. So it, it, that's that to me is a really uh, fascinating cross pollination right there. But one of the things that I wanted to make sure that we talked about is how does a lot of this apply to your concept of philosophical midwifery? Can you t- talk to me about the concept and about the book? Okay. Um, in a way, we have touched on it with that story. All right. But um, <clears throat> you see, the, the, the philosophical midwifery starts on uh, its departure point. The way it begins is to recognize that mankind is struggling with problems they do not understand they have. And therefore, we're in a, we live in a world where we, there's an ignorance, a vital kind of ignorance that's blocking us from our highest goals. And we, and therefore, all of our frustrations are because we have a false idea of reality and of the self. When you are, this kind of ignorance root, with its roots in a culture, what is this, what does that mean? Okay, let me change it. When we gained speech, the power of speech, that allowed us then to ascend to a different kind of reality, we're using the mind. <clears throat> now, there are all kinds of different cultures around the world. Each one is likely to have a primary false idea of the soul. Why? Hey, that survival. It is a key to one's survival because a, what we call the sick belief, the pathologos, mm-hmm. is something we learn within our families that is reinforced by the society we live in, creating a bond. That bond gives every, every person in a family an identity, a role, where the primary goal of there's nothing more important than the family culture. Ah. Ah. You know what that means? That's primitive. Hey, we're coming out of a primitive heritage. How do we do that? If we ever teach our children in schools everywhere, hey, you know what? If you have a problem, you're lucky. You see you have a problem. Okay, describe it. Ah, see whether you can then take that description into a state of mind. Oh. See whether or not that state of mind you can trace back throughout your whole life after problem, after problem, after problem with that one thing being the primary force. Okay, then it's time to say, where did it begin? How did it begin? Well, it always begins. Number one, it begins when a child is having fun. When they're free, when they're doing what they most want to do within the confines of the family, they're in an open state of mind. That's when the parent seizes upon the child to impose upon them, transmits to them their primary beliefs. Oh, how do they do that? Since it's going to be a lie. 
they have to appear to the child sincere, strong, knowing, caring, beautiful at times. They have to appear that way. Wait a minute, that's, that's astonishing that the appearance of virtue is the cause of vice. Oh, then what must the child do? They have to wake up later in life and say, hey, you know what? I'm tired of all the screw-ups I've had. I must try to find out the origin of it in particular scenes in my past. Oh, when they do this and they see the particular circumstances, they revisited, relive. They can now do the next thing. I suggest to them, now please make believe you can talk to your parents and tell them what you see they are doing to you. If you can put that into words, to that degree, you are free and you, re you are regaining that state you formerly were denied and were kicked out of earlier in your youth. Now, I went with this theory for many years, helping people, right? <clears throat> But something I said to myself, Pierre, not deep enough. The kinds of problems people are bringing up are really problems, but they're not the primary ones behind all of the surface problems. So I said, hey, you know what? Plato says the most important thing for him is the inner voice. And he describes that inner voice and the source of it is the same as dreams. I said, hey, that's it. So I then studied and invited people, anyone who had a problem, forget your present, just bring your dreams now, dreams will be astonishing. Every single one is going to be astonishing because you'll find one principle throughout them all. Every dream is going to tell you what you have ignored that's fundamental to your spiritual and intellectual life. Everyone doesn't make any of it over and over, whatever it is. Hey, now you can now, by analysis of the dreams, help people see what it is they've ignored. That will give you the key to their early problem. Therefore, it's a most direct way to get to that early problem, which up to this point has been disguised. Difficult to believe it's playing that kind of a role. Like, a good number of people will finally be astonished and say, Pierre, 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 I can't do this. I love my parents. They've sacrificed so much for me. I'd say, hey, you know what? The good they've done, credit them. But they don't know that they're doing this and the, and the implications of it, nor the consequences of it. Because you know where they learned it? from their parents right, and their parents. So we had this discussion and luckily enough, one of the members said, hey, I have a friend of mine who's got a seven-year-old, eight-year-old boy, <clears throat> big problem. Can you talk to him? I said, yeah. Hey, he came with his mother the kid opened up his past, which is his present, <laughs> mm. <laughs> and revealed what she has been doing to him that caused him the problems he was having in school. And she said, oh, my God, I think I got that from my mother. 
can you talk to my mother? I said, sure. So the grandmother, the mother, and the son showed up in the next week. The grandmother listened to it for about 10 minutes and said goodbye. Yeah. I don't want to hear it. I got it from my mother. <laughs> yep. That's a common tale. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we we're sitting over coffee and uh, a friend of mine who's a psychologist, you know what they are. Uh, there are pe people who are taught anything you, anything you want to do, do, and uh, it should work out. <laughs> they have no method. They have no <laughs> principles. <laughs> Anyhow, she got a PhD in psychology. And she came up and she said, Pierre, why don't we do a study? You write it. She said, uh, let, let's do a book. I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it under one circumstance. Let's pick two people with their dreams. Let's build a book around these two people. You do a, a psychological examination based upon the Godshuck laser content analysis scale which, by the way, nearly all pharmaceutical houses use. Because if there's a new drug coming on the market, if you want to find out whether it's a negatively affecting someone, just look at their speech patterns and you can describe it. So she said, I'll use that in the book. I said, go ahead, let's do it. So out came philosophical midwifery. So we have the only validation of our method. There's no psychology system that is offered a validation of their method, which means what? Can you describe what you are doing in such detail <clears throat> that it can be used as a method for showing the progress of his, from a patient? And can you show that that very progress is significant to their overall growth? No one has done that except me and philosophical midwifery that Regina Oliana, the psychologist, did as part of the book. That's incredible. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I actually, I, I recently got my copy. So, <laughs> um, so, uh, Nearing the end here, I have a canned question for you. Every guest gets it, and I all kind of put them on the spot. But um, for our audience that has been listening to this wonderful conversation today, uh, could you recommend three books uh, that um, or articles, what have you, that you would recommend somebody uh, check out if they wanted to go a little further into some of these topics and uh, you can feel free to list your own philosophical midwifery or, or whatever else. Well, philosophical midwifery would be one. <clears throat> now I have about <clears throat> 20 dialogues that are not published. Wow. I have five major works that have been published as articles that need to be brought together as a book because it brings together all of the principles. Like one of them is called The Betrayal of Philosophy, where I point out, hey, unless you get to this basic dimension of human experience, you're not touching what's vital to mankind. And therefore, unless you recover that vision, you see, I left out something important. When I got into Homer, not only did I discover the role of the self, but Achilles, the, the hero of Homer's Iliad, his best friend, dies because of a mistake that Achilles made about his conquests, all right? Achilles turns around and he says, hey, 
I have to, I have to get out of this. We'll call it problem. They didn't use the word problem. They said, whatever brought me to make these decisions that have brought about the death of my dearest friend, Patroclus, I have to see. Therefore, he goes through a recollection, which in heart is philosophical midwifery. So therefore, hey, we find that uh, Homer already had in principle philosophical midwifery. But the difficulty with trying to recover the Greek world is that nothing has been saved from 800 BC until five or 600 BC. It's all been eliminated just as the Christians did when they destroyed the Alexandrian library and et cetera, right? They're book burners. So our task is to use the fragments that we have to recover that golden age, which is the Greek world. So that in Homer, there already is the principles of philosophical midwifery. And I put that in this betrayal of philosophy, mm -hmm. that we're ignoring our own wisdom and tradition. That's Europe. See, they water down Plato, they water down Plotinus, they water down Proclus, they water down Homer in order to save their butt. Mm -hmm. And we have to say, excuse me, gentlemen, what you throw out, we'll pick up. I did one that just came out this, this couple of weeks ago called Socrates and Jesus in Heaven, mm. Dialogue in Heaven. And uh, I, I spent many years trying to understand this literature, and I brought all together in this one book. And I'll give you the whole book in one sentence. Socrates approaches Jesus in heaven and he says, hey, could we be the cause of all the problems down there? And Jesus says, what? He said, yeah, neither of us wrote down what we thought. We've left it to interpreters what we should have put in into words ourselves. Mm. That's a whole book. Yeah. What that's follows great. from that? So that's just out. Great. Wonderful. I don't know whether I'd call that the second one, though. You see, it's when I was talking about the kind of thought we're now engaged in. Right. But... Uh, <clears throat> Well, how about um in terms of some of the the Taoist stuff? I know you made some de some really good recommendations uh, during the class to for for that, whether it be Ji Man Xing or uh, well, there was one other. <clears throat> well, to <so> Taoism, <clears throat> you can take Taoism and Plato's Parmenides. And by a nice analysis, you can see one is a, is a complement of the other. Now, that, uh, that's not anywhere. You know, I talk about it, but I haven't put it in, into a writing paper. But uh, the way to get into Taoism for myself, I study with Jiming Shen, one of the great Taoists. But <clears throat> subsequently, I got into Taoism through the uh, uh, Lu, Ming, uh, Lu Ai Ming commentary called The Inner Teachings of Taoism. So I would say in terms of seeing the interrelationship between Greek and Taoism, that book would be a very good help. Uh, and uh, 
Yeah. See, Jimmy Shen also, when I was with him, he did a, three beautiful articles we were published. And one is on the relation between Greek thought, Hellenic thought, and Taoism, which is a beautiful article which I would certainly recommend. Great. Excellent. Yeah. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. We've we've hit on uh, quite a few of some of my favorite topics between Platonism and Taoism, two of my main focuses. And I mean, there's really no very few people that you can learn these things from, such as yourself. So I appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. And um, I'm looking forward to any 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 new publications. Pleasure. <laughs>